So welcome all of you to the round table of refugee and sanctuary cities. And we are very pleased to have such an interesting audience that we have the list here of all of you, where you come from. Uh, you come from 20, at least 20 different countries. And we also have here represented a lot of DTIF from the universities to the organizations, to the social movements, and also to the municipalities. So this is also, it's a great challenge to us to make this experience today interesting for all of you. So we, 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 we want to share these interesting debates with all the, these speakers today. We think that the, wo the word fairless cities has a very special meaning when we talk about refugees and migrants. As our cities and towns are welcoming them and providing a space of sanctuary to undocumented, most of the time, residents. So we believe that we are making the difference, but we also believe that together, as a community, we can build a better sense of what is our meaning of citizenship. Citizenship, from the, from the global perspective of the unfair international or national laws, and also to the local imaginary and construction of their narrative about what is a refugee or what is a migrant. And also the minimum of citizenship from the concept that all of those that cohabit, produce, and reproduce the city and its rights. Instead of the citizenship related to the papers that the states are denying and instead of are building the walls and the fences in our countries. And we also want to create a new meaning of what is citizenship as a debate on how we can support newcomers becoming active co-producers of the right to the city. And more of that, we want them to be also political subjects, to be treated as us, as at the same level than everybody. And we also want to know how cities can start to imagine the integration beyond the idea of the assimilation into the nation. And finally, we, as a society, as an individual, we are all transpor transformed by this process. But what are the main changes and challenges when we talk about transforming the people's ideals of charity into the solidarity in our neighborhoods, in our movements, and in our institutions. And for instance, facing the racism xenophobia that is scarily raising in the near and the far away context. So our sessions is gonna be three different parts. The first part is gonna be a 50 minutes moderated by Bu Rutsen, who is an activist from the Barcelona and Comú and he will present the specific three main areas that we wanna debate and the specific questions that we are gonna share with the four speakers we have here. Um, after the 50 minutes of debate, we will start a second part of the session that we wanna share experience, proposals, and a species of action with you where we can collaborate, we can practically collaborate between two or more organizations or two or more citizens, cities. For the second part of the session, we wanna emphasize the importance of not duplicating the existing networks. We think they are very interesting networks and we wanna ask you today to share it with you if you are part of it. So, in the email that I sent you, I ask you for two minutes uh, interventions from the audience. If some of you have some interesting experience to say, to, to, to share with us about these collaborations. And finally, we, ha we will have a 10 minute session to compile the debates and the main ideas share it that will be recorded and compiled by Jean Alexandra Calvo there and Adam Lang there. And they are gonna share with us the main ideas that we share today. So for the panel, today we have four speakers. So welcome all of you and thank you for sharing this morning with us. Uh, we have uh, Ignacy Calvo, 
who is a coordinator of the refugee city plan of the municipality of Barcelona. So he's, gone, he's an expert in international human rights law, and he's also been managing humanitarian visions in developing countries for 16 years, and he, he's gonna share this experience. We also have Lior Danan. <laughs> she's the chief of the staff at the New York City Major's Office of Immigrant Affairs from the New York City. If I'm wrong, just let me know. <laughs> She's a foreign uh, policy professional with a record of entrepreneurial leadership in the public and non-profit sector. And she's also an international affairs expert with experience in the Middle East, Central Asia, Africa, and South Africa. We also have Daniel Gutierrez there. He's a member of the Interventionistisch Linke, sorry, <laughs> you can better pronounce it and the Solidarity City of Berlin, which is an alliance composed in late 2015 of multiple organizations that struggle together for securing access to the municipal service for refugees and undocumented persons in Berlin. And finally, but not <laughs> least, we have also Christina Moschavidou. Uh, that sh mm, she's a uh, volunteer from Omnes in Greece she has an, an interesting curriculum because she is a descendant from Greek refugees from the Black Sea area and born to migrant parents in Sweden. So in 2015, she joined the volunteers of Kilkis in Idomeni. She's a co-founder of the Voluntary Association Omns, Omnes, and a, that is a long-term housing and integration program that promotes and supports self-reliance, autonomy, and integration of almost 500 persons, including asylum, asylum seekers and Greek residents. So, Bu, if you can introduce us the questions for the debate and... Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks. Um, so, uh, I'm Bu Rübner Hansen. Uh, I'm originally from Denmark. I've been staying here a while in Barcelona, uh, working not directly with Ignasi, but working with the city council to to write a strategy of how the city could bring more refugees to Barcelona, which is, you know, in most cities that would be a bizarre proposal. Uh, but it has to do with, of course, the profile of Barcelona, the kind of uh, polit politics of solidarity, and it also has with the idea that we can do integration differently, because one of the reasons why people are trying to avoid refugees is not just xenophobia, but that they have no idea how to receive people. And this is something we'll hear from from Ignasi, how Barcelona is thinking differently about this. Um, so we have three uh, sets, or let's say three themes of questions that we'll go through, and every speaker will have five minutes to address that kind of set of questions. Um, but first, we should we should hear like briefly from you guys what is it that you're working on? What is what is the initiative or the, the work that you do with the institution you're within. Um, so we start with, the, with five minutes to give us a, an introduction to that. So uh, Ignacy, uh, would you start? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for being here on a Sunday morning like this, so it uh, says a lot about your commitment. So uh, I'm just gonna uh, put four, uh, four subjects on, uh, on the table and then we will see how uh, <coughs> Uh, how we address them with your questions, what your proposals. So, um, Barcelona Refugee City was created uh, at the September tw uh, 15, when all we saw on the uh, TV the images of lots of people uh, uh, passing the borders of uh, of, uh, of Europe. Um, they said something. Is that we, we need uh, to say something to to put a bit of, of context on how the context has changed since these two years, no? So the first thing we saw, it was... Speak up. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm gonna stand up if you want, so uh, I don't know if it's gonna be like this, but... So uh, um, I just wanted to put a, a bit of, of the context on, on Europe, just for the non-European uh, people that, that you are here. So we just found a, a context that has changed a lot between in, in these uh, in this, uh, two years of... of, of uh, so-called refugee crisis, which we don't think it's a, it's a refugee crisis. Something else we can talk uh, about later. So the first thing that uh, you need to 
gets a, a self-declaration of, uh, of, uh, of a refugee city is to be backed by your civil society. So we are really lucky in Barcelona. We have a really, really committed and really, really old and really, really uh, uh, rooted uh, civil society that is clearly, clearly uh, uh, much uh, ahead of us. So that is trying always to push the municipalities are always trying to push politics and they always try to push on migration and, and, and refugee related issues. So uh, uh, we did a poll on 2016 that uh, stated that more than 80% of the people of the city wanted to welcome more refugees, which is something that it was absolutely unique in, in the whole Europe. No? We had uh, kind of three months ago a huge march uh, in Barcelona City, which was the huge march in, in the, that has been uh, 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 in Europe, claiming for a, a, a fairer uh, refugee uh, welcoming policies in, in, the, in, the, in the city, in the state, and the region. <coughs> so second thing and second idea that I would, like to, I would like to address is, a part of that, you need to have a specific policies. So you, go, you get into the specific policies uh, of the city hall. Um, how you create these specific policies. So Barcelona had none uh, public policy on refugee uh, issues. It, had a it has a long tradition on migrants. So if you look at the statistics, you will see that from 2001 to 2010, the city received an average of 28,000 migrants a year, which is huge, which is more than the, the, the numbers that they have in, in Greece, for example. And there has been no significant problems on, on, on integration. So the second thing is um, you need to create a policy which is cross-cutting in the whole policies of the, of the city hall, meaning that, um, uh, that uh, you, you have to see migration as an asset and as a positive issue and not as a problem. So as a problem on doing new economics, doing new social relationships, new, uh, building new urbanism, et cetera, et cetera. So it's something that you need to have a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of cross-cutting uh, uh, issues. No? Second thing, uh, third thing, sorry, um, you need to make welcoming policies uh, as soon as possible. This is a, <coughs> something really classic that you always say. For everyone, regardless their legal status. So this is something that uh, we are doing this in, Bar in Barcelona. So we are now, we now promoted a new uh, law, a new, uh, it's not a law, it's I don't know how you say it, a new um, law proposition on irregularity. This means that all irregulars need to have the same rights as legal migrants as, as refugee in order not to create, you know, this <clears throat> stupid concurrence between the poorer and the poorest and, and fighting the, for, the, for the small resources that we have now. Because don't forget that we come from a huge, several, uh, huge economic crisis in the city and we have people uh, that uh, we have social policies that target locals, migrants, refugees, and all kind of citizens that live in Barcelona. The fourth thing is uh, uh, you yeah, need to create, and we need to create now in Barcelona, uh, an, uh, something that I said before, it's that um, a new public policy on refuge. So Spain has never been a country for refugees, it's been a country for, for migrants. Uh, one, uh, three, uh, sorry, two out of three uh, uh, asylum uh, um, requests are rejected. And, uh, uh, and social benefits for <coughs> refugees are absolutely uh, 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 basic and they're not focused to integration. So this is something that uh, cities have to create and have to manage to, go to, to empower and to make the life of, this, of, our, of our citizens uh, 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 easier. Third, uh, the second, uh, something that I wanted also to say is just need, you need to put uh, policies, at, uh, these policies at the political agenda. You need everybody to get focused and you need everybody to take position on that. On the other side, it is something that I think we, 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 we achieved. We put migration and, and, and refugee uh, uh, policies on the agenda, on the political agenda, in the state, in the region, and in Europe. So this is something that I think that is quite positive and it's something that we can, we can be happy on that. And four, and I'm going to finish this uh, here because I think my time is over, you need to create a lot of networks. So you need to choose in which formal and existing networks you, you want to work in and really get into them. 
So we choose, for example, we choose the uh, US cities as a real huge platform of cities who have a power and who have really, really uh, uh, the power to, to, to create a, a state of, of uh, opinion in, in the EU. And you need to create the political uh, networks that you are interested in to put, the, to put the message that you want in. So, in, in, and as an example of that, we created with, uh, with other major cities of Athens, uh, Amsterdam, Berlin, uh, Ljubljana, several ones, the, the Solidarity Cities Network, which is now a politic, a real politic network, which is an informal network, but who wants really, really to push on basically on relocation between uh, uh, city to city relocation and to jump the state uh, policies on that. So I leave it here, we can discuss later. Uh, thank you very much, hope that was interesting. Mm -hmm. no, 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 it's <laughs> I might try sitting down and speaking up, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I want to speak to what we're doing in the New York Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs at three levels. So the municipal, the national, and the international. Um, so New York is 60% immigrants or children of immigrants, uh, which would make you think that our office would have more resources than it does, but um, it's, a, it's a major part of what, what New York is. And our job in the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs is to promote the well-being of immigrant communities through programs and policies that help to bring them into the civic, cultural, and economic life of the city. And we do this through, in three major areas, three main goals. Uh, the first is ensuring immigrant access to city services and helping to facilitate immigrant inclusion um, across all of local governments. So in New York, immigrants' uh, families have access to most city services, including health care services, education, uh, emergency food and shelter, public safety, legal services, mental health services, and uh, anti-discrimination protection. Uh, one of our flagship integration programs is our IDNYC, the Municipal ID Card, um, which recently reached one million cardholders in New York City. Um, the administration had heard repeatedly from vulnerable communities in New York that this was something really important to them, so they created this government-issued ID for anyone 14 years or older, regardless of their immigration status. Um, and importantly, it can be used as an ID card for interacting with the New York Police Department. Um, but one key thing to mention about that we think is very important to the success of this municipal ID card is that um, it was meant to, it's meant to support immigrant communities, but not to stigmatize them. <clears throat> so it was always pitched as a card for all New Yorkers, not just for immigrants. It has all of these perks and benefits like um, memberships to mu famous museums and things like that that have made it <clears throat> uh, something really popular for everyone to have. And um, the number of card holders that we've reached has made clear that it's not, it can't just be the undocumented in New York. Uh, another major component of our integration work is language access. We have a uh, award-winning television program that volunteers use to facilitate um, <clears throat> uh, um, teaching of English to, to those with lim limited English proficiency in New York. And we work across all city agencies to ensure language access. And maybe one last thing to say on, on integration issues is that it's not a one way, just pushing out city services to immigrant communities. We actually have a team of 15 organizers in our office who are out in the five boroughs of New York um, working with immigrant communities all the time and trying to encourage civic engagement um, so that it's more of a mutual exchange. So that's integration. Uh, the second area of our work is access to justice for immigrant populations, uh, which we do primarily through our program that we call Action NYC that provides free legal screenings um, through a network of community-based, nonprofit organizations, um, and increasingly we're doing this through schools, which is a really a trusted place uh, for immigrant families to come to. Um, in the upcoming executive budget, the city has dedicated uh, $16.4 million to legal services. With baseline funding, it's a, we have an overall investment of $31 million for legal services, which is the largest investment of any city in the country. Um, and it means that New Yorkers who are facing deportation will have city-funded support and, um, and uh, uh, legal representation. In light of the recent election, we're also expanding our efforts on a number of fronts related to access to justice. So 
there's been a demonstrated need for more uh, what we call Know Your Rights trainings, Know Your Rights forums. Our legal services hotline saw a 240% increase from January to February of this year, which is when the presidential inauguration happened. Um, so we've conducted hundreds of Know Your Rights workshops this year, and we're increasingly coordinating across the city to make sure that all the gaps are covered. Um, we're also expanding our citizenship program because we know that for the 650,000 lawful permanent residents or green card holders in New York, the best way to prevent deportation is to become a citizen. Um, and so we're looking at, at ways that we continue to, to further that. Uh, the final category of our city work is advocacy. And uh, this is where I can talk about some of our national level work. Our office helps to coordinate a coalition of 150 mayors and county executives across the country uh, who are working together on a, on a pro-immigrant agenda. Um, Cities for Action was launched in 2014 uh, dur during the Obama administration um, to, in response to some of President Obama's executive actions on immigration. But in the current political climate, we're having to play a very different kind of role. Um, the coalition is, is really unique because it's comprised just of cities. It's run by cities for cities, for city administrations. Um, all together, the members of the coalition represent 56 million people and over 15 million foreign-born residents uh, of the United States. And we're seeking to use the power of the collective voice of this coalition um, to uh, push for a pro-immigrant agenda on, through a range of efforts, uh, legal briefs, days of action, statements, op-eds, and coordinating efforts with our partners. So we can talk some more about uh, Cities for Action maybe during the debate and questions. Um, I would just uh, maybe lay out the three broad objectives of the coalition are to ensure the public safety of all communities in our cities, uh, to protect immigrant rights and benefits that are, and services that are available to immigrant communities, and to advocate against any discriminatory federal policies that place any religious or other bars uh, on immigrant or refugee programs, including the travel ban issue. Um, so maybe lastly, you know, just to mention, given the setting, I've talked, you know, about the, the local and the national. We're also now just starting to connect more with cities globally to make our collective voice even more powerful. So we're very interested in being part of this conversation and others. Um, we, you know, we are just starting to talk to other cities and to think about how we might uh, approach our international conversation in the way that we've done nationally to try to build a strong a coalition as possible to share information about best practices and then determine the best ways that we can advocate together both in our own national levels but also multilaterally. So this afternoon, I'm uh, after, right after this panel, I'm flying to London where we have a, a planning session with a handful of cities that um, are getting together to prepare for a global mayor summit that uh, Mayor de Blasio will be hosting in New York this September. And that summit will have two, kind of two major components. We'll be doing cities to cities exchange on best practices, and we'll also be um, uh, thinking about how we can inform and make city views known around the 2018 Global Compact on Migration and try to influence that process. So happy to discuss these more as we go forward. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Leora. Uh, and now, uh, as Ignacio was saying, it's very important if you're in city government to have a civil society that's ready to help receive people and that's also pushing the city council, mm -hmm. which is a, city, a civil society and social movements that com is composed not just of long-term locals, but also of, of migrants, of course. Um, and now we will go over to people from the civil society who will talk more about how they do innovation within a, in a, in, within a less institutional context. Uh, should we start with you, uh, Dan? Yeah, okay, so um, if you can't hear me, just like wave at me and then I'll raise my voice a little bit. Louder? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so my name is Daniel Gutierrez, and uh, I come from, I'm coming from Berlin right now, uh, where we're trying to develop uh, what we call a solidarity city, which is not unlike a uh, sanctuary city. Um, our project began after uh, like a certain cycle of struggles developed when um, 
when the Arab Spring developed the kind of political vacuum that allowed uh, mass migration to kind of occur from Africa and the Middle East uh, into Europe. Um, around 2013, 14, 15, uh, we had like the, like the first serious like manifestations that began to develop from the grassroots and it began from refugees and migrants themselves. It was a moment of self-organization in which uh, the refugee, refugees really pushed the ball forward and made themselves absolutely visible in a way that couldn't be denied. And the kind of peak to that was uh, the march to Brussels that occurred, I believe, in 2014, around there. And um, that was followed by a number of occupations that occurred throughout the city of Berlin. Um, during that uh, kind of uh, micro cycle, most of the refugees were coming out of uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And um, they developed a strategy of occupation in order to make uh, their struggles visible. Um, this was a moment of a uh, great amount of civil participation and a great amount of protest, but what became realizable was that um, nothing actually changed politically. Like we had tens of thousands of people protesting, if not millions, across Germany, but the actual result, the actual political result was nothing. So for those of us at the grassroots, that kind of forced uh, a certain sense of reflection of, well, what do we have to do in order to combat this? So um, fast forward to the, uh, the opening of the borders, supposedly by Angela Merkel in 2015. And uh, Angela Merkel did this uh, seemingly awesome thing in which she was praised by the rest of the free world for like opening the borders to all these needy refugees. But what ended up being actually true was that Angela Ber Merkel did open the borders. Uh, I mean, they were already open. Uh, she allowed a bunch of people to come by, but simultaneously uh, was changing and redrafting uh, deportation policy in order to make it much easier to deport those with, that were then coming in. And so, um, after this, or around the same time of this, we had uh, a couple comrades from Nor No One Is Illegal Toronto come by to Berlin and um, they gave a presentation on sanctuary cities. And this is kind of where Solidarity City began uh, out of an exchange of ideas from different people from different parts of the world to see if this could be something that could be translatable to Berlin. And given Berlin's uh, unique composition of being a city-state in the German Federal Republic, we uh, decided to really push for that. And so, uh, since then, we've developed a kind of alliance of different organizations, as well as individuals. And the way that we organize that is that we have organizations that all meet once a month in order to develop a strategy to move forward. And then, uh, for all the individuals that are unaffiliated uh, to any kind of actual grassroots organization, um, we kind of looked there towards Barcelona and we looked towards Brazil, like with the Workers' Party, and we decided to develop kind of like bases nuclear, where we, um, where we develop kind of like cellular structures throughout the city in order to bring in broader civil participation. And so that kind of builds a nexus between the public in general and grassroots organizations that have very specific interests to push forward. So um, since then, what we've tried to develop is a strategy of, like well, what we noticed was that protests in general, um, they weren't working in the way that we wanted them to work. A problem with that was that if we asked, oh, we want health care for uh, refugees or undocumented folk, well, the state would come back and say, no, well, there is health care that exists through the health care passes or something like that. And uh, the state would then be able to define the answer of what health care actually means. So what we decided was that we wanted to actually develop our own policy proposals in order to put the ball in, uh, where we want it, like where we want the conversations to begin is with our concrete proposals. And so um, this occurs through basically a process of like co-research 
where we talk to refugees and undocumented folk that are part of the alliance. And then we basically came up with five different fields in which they need help. Uh, that's access to health, education, housing, work, and civil rights, like being able to go to the police to report a crime without having to worry about being deported. And uh, after that, we asked them, well, which one of these things do you need most? And that's health. And then from there, we began kind of like a dialectical process of uh, coming up with research, feeding it back to the grassroots, modifying, and then moving it forward to government. And so this is where we're at right now, basically. So, and now we have uh, Christina, uh, right from the border of Macedonia, or? Yes, Firum, Firum we call it, yes. Uh, yeah, it, you bear a little bit with me because I'm not a used public speaker, so uh, I'll try to do my best. Um, like listening to the people in the panel, I can say that we're a little bit different because uh, I come from Kilkis. It's a very small city. The, the regional unit has 80,000 uh, local residents. Uh, it is exactly where Idomeni was, if uh, people know it, it's from the informal camp of Idomeni, which is in the border to Firum, where a lot of people crossed to get to Central Europe, which was the dream. Uh, and we, we went there as activists, as volunteers in 2014, uh, where there were no state presence, there were no fences, there were no borders. And we went there with first aid, medicine, food, water, clothes, but mostly to try and reduce the violence because it was a totally different scene back then. Uh, a couple of hundred people became a thousand, tens of thousands, and the crossing, it was going. Like you said, when Angela said, come to, to Germany, everybody came. And then after a while, they said, nobody will pass, and they closed the borders. And in a regional unit with 80,000 local residents, we had 25,000 people stuck, stranded, with a local hospital for this region with two ambulances, which was not enough for the locals, and it was certainly not enough to have plus 25,000 people. So the vision of my circle of friends, which was a grassroots movement, which then became ominous, uh, was to try and do something good for everyone. Uh, when they closed the borders, though, that was when the formal temporary refugee camps came to the area, and we had two. Uh, the one that is near Kilkis was, uh, was near a village called Kherso. Uh, population 600 people, no information to the villagers. One day they woke up, they had a camp with 4,000 people in very inhumane conditions. Uh, if you've ever been in a camp, it was military tents, no floors, not enough toilets. It was not humane conditions, and it was not a camp that should have been on European soil. Uh, we were called there by the municipality of our town, actually, uh, to help. Uh, and we realized soon enough that uh, you cannot make a camp someone's home. Uh, and last March 2016, the weather was really bad. It gets cold in the north of Greece. It was raining. And we said we have to do something, people will die, children will die. And we just asked our friends and their friends, and in four days we managed to get 75 families out of the camp to be hosted in Greek families. Uh, but as you also said before, we do not see it as a refugee crisis, it's an economical crisis. And we saw that this is not sustainable because people couldn't host another family when they couldn't even take care of their own family. So then we said, okay, we have to make something, we have to go a step further, we have to do something more. So we did a socioeconomic study, which we presented to the municipality, to the region, to, to all the units, uh, and the plan was to close the camp, to take the people out of the camp and to place them in the nearby villages in our area uh, so they could live like us. Uh, we didn't have a positive response. Everybody says this cannot be done. You're romantics. Um, so we said, okay, maybe we cannot do this. We will start small scale. 
so we started renting apartments on our own, uh, still not being an association. We got donations uh, and help from small grassroots organizations through Europe. Actually, we had a lot of help from uh, Catalonia and Sweden and Holland. And uh, so we rented the apartments. We had 17 families living, but we still saw that it is still not enough because we're not professionals. We cannot give the, the support that they need. Uh, and after many, many months, we got an email saying that from someone saying, we can fund you. So now, in November last year, we, uh, we made Omnes, our association, and uh, we are at the moment hosting five, around 500 people in our city. We have 95 apartments. We will soon have 105 apartments. Uh, but Omnes means in Latin all. And our vision is that this should be for all. Because if you live, to put something in context, if you live in a city with 13% far-right voters, uh, where the elected <coughs> member of parliament in Athens from the far-right party is from your city, you cannot only focus on refugees or migrants because you fuel what they're saying. So you have to think about all, and we want to think about all. So in our housing, we actually have Greek residents in the risk of social exclusion as well. Um, and everything that comes has to be for everyone, the local residents, the refugees, the migrants. Uh, but housing in itself is not enough. So we have a system, we have like a three pillars. So the first one is to house people, to make them safe, secure, and then we have a, a a social integration, which is a kind of a school, I don't like the term, but I don't know how else to put it. Uh, and the third one that we are developing now is the livelihood. What will we do? Because people will apply for asylum in Greece soon, they will stay, and we need to create more jobs for them, because there are no jobs in Greece, so we have to create new ones for them, for us. Uh, and we're trying, we have a plan to do, uh, what would you say, ecological farming in our region because to a lot of the people involved are also very involved in the environmental issues and we have a, a strong fight against the, against the gold mines in our area. So we have to, to try and combine everything uh, and see it in the bigger picture. Um, and I think that this is uh, mostly what we do, like to summarize it all. And uh, yeah, I can answer questions later, yeah. but, but it's, it's very difficult because it's, it's three years of, of being active. You cannot summarize it in, in 10 minutes. Uh, but, I have to, but I have to say only that uh, the model that we use is, is, is apartments in, how to say, the web of, of the city. So it's not buildings, it's not ghetto buildings, because then you have the far right having them as an easy target. Uh, but we can discuss that later on as well. I don't know. Thank you. Um, so now we go over to the questions. And our idea is we have three thematic blocks. Uh, one about the question of national law, European law, uh, and United States law versus, uh, versus um, let's say, federal law versus uh, state law. Um, then we have questions around social movements and the relation with local government uh, and party organizations. Uh, and finally, we have a blog around the imaginaries and constructions of narratives about refugees and migrants, etc. Um, so we start with the block around different levels of uh, existing law, how it can be um, <coughs> challenged. Uh, and the, the way we progress is that uh, I post the three questions. You don't have to answer all of them. Just if, what, if you have something relevant and interesting to say on one of them, you pick them out and you just answer that. You have up to five minutes each, and you don't have to use the five minutes. Um, so... Um, 
How do you deal with the limits and contradictions of, of national uh, and European slash federal law? How, have you found ways to hack, ignore, or disobey existing laws? Uh, and how can changing ad, uh, administrative priorities, for instance, decreasing uh, the hours uh, of staff dedicated to some areas uh, and increasing them on another, those kinds of priorities where you don't change the law, how can they um, be used to lessen the burden of unjust laws? Um, so that's the first kind of question block. Um, then there's another question which I think uh, Leora has already spoken uh, very uh, eloquently about. Uh, have you found ways to make sure that newcomers can get access to health services and report crimes to the police, amongst other things, uh, especially uh, undocumented migrants, um, in, if, if they can do it in a way where they, uh, where they don't have to fear identification and deportation? So there's a municipal ID card. Uh, we can talk about, about Barcelona if there's anything on the table. And finally, how can networks of cities best lobby, campaign, and create material leverage, leverage to channel, uh, challenge national governments or the EU or the federal level uh, in the states? Um, what, is, what is possible there and what is not, and what is the role of citizens' networks and social movements in helping city governments challenge uh, higher levels of law? Um, so we, should we just take it in the same order? Uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, Great questions because I don't have an answer. So uh, <laughs> I'll try to take to say a bit what we've done in Barcelona. So uh, um, about being a, uh, so well f by blocks. So um, about competences. So uh, we face the huge debate of competences in, in, in our in our in our municipalities. So. Uh, uh, we have some competence on, on, uh, on newcomers, we have some competence in migration, not all of them. Uh, so others are shared with, um, uh, gov uh, with, the, uh, with the regional uh, governments, others are shared or it should be uh, uh, financed by the state, but which, which are not financed, so we have a huge, huge debate on competences. The thing that we, uh, we, we solved out is that uh, when you have a competence, you, can, you cannot do less of your competence, but you can do more on, the, on, on your competence. Uh, you have to be uh, uh, open that this competence will be, uh, if you do more, so you might have a tribunal that uh, is going to, to, uh, to uh, how you say this, uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, yeah, to sanction uh, and, and to say that you're not able to do it. But on the meantime, you've done all what you can. So you create something that, that you can. So this is a, a kind of civil, uh, 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 an official uh, civil dis uh, dis disobedience. On the other side, uh, you, uh, when you make a civil uh, disobedience, you have to be aware that the consequences are going to be for you. And on the migrants and refugee uh, issues, there is a very, very blurry uh, uh, border between the consequences uh, that are going to be for you and the consequences are going to be for the migrant. Uh, when all this uh, uh, crisis began, we all thought on Let's go, well, let's get a boat, let's go to Lesbos and take people here, and that's it. Okay, but the consequence, were not going to be for us, which would be yeah, a sanction, uh, an economical sanction for the municipality or so on, but there would be for the migrant or the refugee that could lose all their status and could be reported and could, be really, uh, uh, could not achieve what they wanted to achieve in, uh, in our city. So this is why we discard these options. You know? About uh, what other the other question? Sorry, I'm just uh, got. Um, um, so I didn't wear my glasses. Sorry, yeah, I'm kind of. So, uh, <laughs> the question of, for instance, municipal ID cards or other ways to give yeah. people access to that. ID yeah. Cards. So uh, what we're doing in Barcelona? So in Barcelona we have uh, something called El Padrón, which is a kind of uh, municipal uh, ID, which is not so so. What we do is uh, we are trying, uh, which, which gives you two basic rights, so health and education, immediately. So this is hard to get unless you, 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 do, uh, you do some measures to, pro uh, to, uh, to, to promote it. So actually, uh, you, can, you can be uh, uh, an undocumented and you get your, it's kind of would be the, uh, the idea of, of, of uh, more or less the idea, but 
in an in a already existing document, in, existing, in already existing. And this is very important because this gives you automatic rights anywhere you go, <coughs> not only in the city of Barcelona, which is, which, is, uh, which is like this also. On the other side... Can, can, I, can I just, to clarify, the empadronamiento is like a municipal register of citizens, it's not the national... Yeah, it's, it's a municipal... Yeah, sorry, sorry, yeah, yeah, I'm going to explain to you. So it's a municipal, uh, it's a municipal uh, uh, a registration, okay, but it has val uh, state validity. So when you are uh, in, in El Padron, you already are an, an accounted as a, as, a, as a citizen of, of your city. And it's something which is your competence, it's a municipal competence on the ways that you can uh, 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 facilitate people to get into the re uh, this register. So uh, we are trying to, we are, and the important thing is that it's really, it's an official uh, document. So it's gonna be recognized outside from here. And it gives you healthcare and education, not only in the city of Barcelona, which it does, but also uh, abroad. So this is very, also very important. So this is what we are, uh, we also promoting kind of this ID, but it's more a kind of a symbolic issue than, than a practical one, okay? Um, and that's it, so uh, please. Just to remind, Sorry. the final question was, and it um, doesn't matter that you flipped it, is how can networks of cities best lobby campaign and create material leverage, leverage to challenge uh, national and supernational yeah, governments? Well, well, there is, sorry, this, I, I want to answer uh, this one also. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sorry. Uh, so yeah, networks are really, really basic and really important for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for lobbying in, in your policies. So, uh, we, are, we are having access to uh, political, uh, instances like uh, European Commission, like uh, governments, like UN, like the Vatican, like anything, thanks to being active in, 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 several, uh, 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 in several networks of cities. There are so many that you, also, you need to be really careful on picking the one that you can and, and work on it, because otherwise, so uh, uh, there's people here, there is, uh, we are also promoting this, uh, in, this uh, in the Euro cities, we are in a group of the European Agenda, which is the first trial of uh, multi-level governance. And we are meeting with uh, the EU, uh, the EU uh, um, commissars, with states and with cities, trying to build, and it's slow, and it's much, much slower than, than what we wanted to, a new conception on multi-level governance. So in putting the cities, okay, on the scope of, uh, of regional and European level of governance. And this is, uh, well, we can uh, further uh, debate it, but uh, it's, I think it's a very, very important issue also. Cool, hey, while we're talking about this, I would like to add something. Is yep. this okay? Uh, yeah, please, yeah, so working, yeah. working on this question of, of how Barcelona could uh, receive more refugees and take, that take the responsibility that the Spanish state was refusing to take within the European reallocation scheme. The Spanish state promised to take yeah, and it, it has taken so far 7% uh, of that. Um, so uh, the, stra the strategy that was developed there I find is in interesting because it has broader, broader implications. Um, the idea was to make a tactical alliance with the EU because the EU had an interest in its reallocation scheme being respected against the Spanish national state. Uh, but in other cases you can have an alliance with the Spanish state against the EU and I think this is very important to think about the role of cities in the sense that they break this dynamic of EU versus national state and introduce a third pole that can make tactical alliances with one or another depending on what the issue is and what is, uh, what is the opening for something more progressive than, uh, than is currently the case. Um, and in the case of, of the city to city relocation, which is something that we have been working for a long time, so we are also doing this. We are working at uh, EU level because the EU is really interested in that uh, the, uh, the scheme is at least works or at least is something that they can have. And at the city level, we are much more interested because just to create a new power, different, on, uh, different than the state power in between the EU. Mm -hmm. So uh, <coughs> it's, I, I know it's not, uh, so we, we, we will have soon news about it. So uh, we'll hope that it's gonna be working on on a medium, small play, um, scale. Sure. Um, so maybe I'll speak to the, the three categories of work I mentioned that cities, 
it's for action the coalition across the country have been working on because this is where it plays out, how, what can cities do vis-a-vis -vis the national government. Mm -hmm. So the first one is uh, public safety and how we think about preventing federal overreach on immigration enforcement. So there are things that we can do, um, some very obvious ones, like we can provide a protocol to the Department of Education for how all schools should interact with the um, Im ICE Immigration and Customs Enforcement officials. Uh, we can provide Know Your Rights services. We can invest heavily in uh, legal services um, to prevent deportation. Uh, but there are things that we can't do. Uh, we can't prevent ICE from conducting immigration enforcement. And this is one of the reasons why actually in New York, we, as an administration, we don't use the sanctuary city label, even though everyone uses it for New York City, because we think it's misleading um, and gives an impression that uh, we can prevent uh, immigration enforcement in a ways that New York City actually cannot. Um, and then there's, there's the in-between, um, where there, we're actively you know, in the finding out where the boundaries actually are. So one of these areas is around federal defunding of um, so-called sanctuary cities. So there are nine jurisdictions now in in the states that have been asked to um, to certify whether or not they are in compliance with the federal laws around immigration enforcement. And this is something active happening this month, and will you know will be seeing what the what the what the boundaries are, and a lot of that will happen in the legal arena. Um, maybe one other, you know, on the, on the kind of legal immigration and benefits space is a, an interesting place to mention where, you know, there's plenty we can do in kind of ag advocacy campaigns. We can use our coalition to campaign around certain issues uh, like on deferred action for childhood arrivals and ensuring that um, benefits that have been given for certain status continue to go forward and to raise awareness. But I think as cities, we also have a different role to play compared to uh, advocates um, because we do have to work with federal partners and they also need us. And so there's a different type of relationship and a different type of conversation. So um, sometimes that gets kind of technical and back end. And I think that there's like, there, it seems boring, like bureaucratic or legal work, but things that because of our offices, expertise and the type of role that we're playing with our coalition, we can, um, uh, you know, still have an impact. So, uh, for example, the U.S. Uh, Citizenship and Immigration Services, um, you know, currently has a, a backlog, they call it pen pending, uh, applications of 600,000 uh, applications for citizenship. So we're pushing for people to apply for citizenship, but there's kind of a bureaucratic back end that's preventing that from moving forward. So that's something that behind the scenes we're trying to have, you know, have meetings and to have conversations on. And there's a, a range of examples like that that aren't necessarily going to be, um, you know, a flashy social media campaign, but, uh, but more of a bureau bureaucratic conversation. Um, and then finally on the, the kind of the travel ban issues, I would say that that's been an area, um, it's a good example because we, um, you know, we don't, cities only have so much control over uh, how, who's led into the country and how many refugees are led into the country, but there are still things that we can do. So during the um, protests and events that were happening in January around our airports, um, we, you know, we, our officials showed up to JFK International Airport and were there with the um, protesters and uh, other officials and helping to, and pro bono lawyers and, and others helping to share information and ensure that, um, that uh, things were moving as smoothly as possible. We've, our coalition has filed multiple, multiple amicus briefs on the travel ban legislation, and uh, now we're trying to look forward. So we've developed a refugee advocacy working group that will focus on the, um, Trump, uh, the President Trump's um, 2018 budget and uh, what it looks like on, on refugees there. Um, and again, there are techni small technical things that cities can do. So now in airports, thinking about ways that uh, from the moment you step off the plane until, you know, in that first corridor, what kind of information is posted um, for cities that own their airports, they can put up Know Your Rights information to ensure that um, as much, uh, as, as, much um, as we can do can be done. Yeah, so um, regarding the, the, like, trying to hack, like, the different levels or see where you could, like, sideline it. Um, so 
where I left off last time, like we have this process of like co-research where we try to uh, come up with a bunch of policy proposals to see what could fit and then we interface that with the people that are actually affected by it, right? So um, that process was uh, hugely experimental and led to some people like saying like, oh, we should have something like in order to provide health services to refugees and undocumented folk, we should get something like what they have in France. But uh, where France has like a federal health uh, system that uh, can do a bunch of things that a uh, privatized health system can't, right? And, um, but that was exactly the problem, was that we're not France, we're Germany, and in order to pull that off, we would have to have national strength to be able to develop an entirely new healthcare system and then be able to implement that. So it was really like gauging what are our actual possibilities and uh, what is the system that we're working with. And so um, what we decided to push for was uh, an anonymous Krankenkarte, which means an anonymous health card, which is a government kind of health uh, card that most Germans have that's not anonymous, but we wanted to have an anonymous one even though we knew that that was impossible. Like there was a realistic expectation that there's no way that the municipality of Berlin can develop this kind of program, but we wanted to be able to develop the, the discursive grounds for that being the actual answer to the problem. And so what we decided to push for was uh, an anonymous Krankenschein, and that's uh, an anonymous health pass. The problem with that, Everything okay? Yeah, no, I'm just realizing, or Anna is realizing and telling me that we're pressed for time. Okay, so I'll hurry up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it's not about you, but it's in general. No, it's cool, don't trip, don't trip. <laughs> yeah, and so basically, um, this health pass has to be distributed, and what we decided to do was push for a health pass, uh, give it actual content because a lot of the refugees and undocumented folk were telling us like, yeah, well, health pass is great and all, but what if they don't speak French? What if they don't speak Spanish? Like, what good does that uh, give me? Or how does that actually allow me to go to the doctor really? Like on paper, it says it's there, but in reality, it's not there. So we came up with a bunch of supplemental demands and then after that developed, um, uh, developed basically an idea that we could uh, autonomize the distribution of that, where basically we develop some kind of council that would then kind of oversee the distribution of that uh, health pass, and then we have uh, civil society organizations made up of migrant organizations or refugee groups um, kind of uh, be elected onto that board that would oversee that. And um, as to the, like someone ultimately has to give that actual uh, health pass out, and so what we decided to do for that um, was uh, follow the example of another organization in uh, Göttingen that's also uh, an alliance member, and basically there they provide uh, health passes to anyone, and even though they're only supposed to provide it to refugees, but by actually having like a militant organization in there, well, since they don't have to uh, document like who they gave it to or why because it's all anonymous, well then they could actually give it out to everyone. So that's like kind of a way that we decided that might be a feasible means to kind of hack the system as a temporary thing. And um, yeah, I'll get to the next thing in another time. Okay, so uh, I, think, uh, I think we have to, we have to change the format somewhat. <laughs> Uh, this is what happens when you have the session in the morning and, uh, and people need extra time for breakfast. Uh, so um, if you want to say something very briefly, just in the... Okay, I can say it, something like... In the interest of yeah. fairness. Yeah, yeah, just so I'm not feeling left out alone. Okay, <laughs> but, but very, very fast, like, uh, because we, we're from the bottom up. That's, we're not a municipality, so, so, what, so what we can do to, to influence like the ones that make the plans. Uh, what, what we did, or what we suggested, was to have a, a, an equal distribution uh, model all over Greece because we said the number that they said was stranded in Greece at the moment was 60,000 people. 60,000 people in Greece is not so much. It, can, it, it is not much. But when you have 25,000 in one region, it is. So, what we, so we made a plan for like the whole of Greece 
stating that uh, taking out uh, small communities, so just uh, cities uh, over tw 20,000 uh, residents, uh, taking uh, out, excluding uh, some touristic areas and some areas that already had a large minority population. So if looking at the health system, because we were talking about that, how many hospitals are there in that region? How many schools are there? Uh, we said that if you, take a po if you split the population and equally distribute it to 6.2 up to 9.2 per thousand, so 6.2 newcomers per thousand local residents, then there wouldn't be a problem. So that's, that's a model that we're trying, and it actually has made it down to Athens, and they have looked at it, so sometimes it goes. Uh, how we help them to know their rights, like in a housing program, at least when they are. We have, um, we have lawyers, so they know uh, if they need help with anything. They have lawyers, they have accountants to teach them how the system in Greece works, because the system is different. In every country you go, it's different. But I will not speak so much more because I, I'm, you're looking at me. <laughs> so, uh, Take it as a, as a yeah. kind of compliment. Yeah. It's very interesting what you say. Uh, so wait, what I'm going to do now is we had two other thematics. I'm going to bring them together. Are they going to be separate from the other two? Uh, yes, we, we will get to that. Yeah. We will speak hopefully, super fast. hopefully. So uh, I will just do one other round, if that's OK. Uh, and then, and then we we take it to the floor. Or? Just me. Yeah. Not, but not everybody can speak if you. Don't. Yeah. So, um, so we, I'll just go through these questions, and you you bring in the most inspiring thing that you want to to <laughs> tell people about, in relation to these questions. And by, please do not address all these questions. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, one, how can local governments support social movements and work to change attitudes towards refugees and migrants and to develop practical solidarity between long-term and, uh, and new citizens of the city? So, that's one. Another, we all know that municipalism is about good governance or a different kind of governance, but can it also be about undoing governance? So, about a kind of deregulation just like neoliberalism was deregulating their friends in the business sector, uh, how can municipalist governance deregulate our friends in civil society, the social movements? Uh, for instance, when it comes to migrants, uh, how can you deregulate the use of public space and decriminalize the survival strategies of, uh, of migrants, for instance? Um, a shorter question. How do we avoid reproducing the distinction between deserving refugees and undeserving migrants? Um, how do we transform paternalistic relations of charity into mutual relations of solidarity between long-term inhabitants and newcomers? Uh, for instance, how do we stop talking about refugees and migrants and start talking with them? Uh, which includes like consultation from, a, from an institutional perspective. How do we support uh, refugees and migrants as political subjects capable of transforming their own lives, so not as clients, but as political subjects who can uh, engage in relations of solidarity with the long-term long uh, inhabitants of the city? And finally, how do we help newcomers access local forms of work uh, with, for instance, supporting the cooperative sector uh, or within the, the public or private sector? Uh, and how do we help them enter relations of economic solidarity, such as trade unions and solidarity economies? Uh, and how will our forms of solidarity and work have to be transformed in order to make space? So not just the question of how they integrate into what we have going, which is actually assimilation, but integration in the proper sense where Something on each side will have to change uh, to make this composition possible. So, uh, <laughs> would you like to start and then we do it the other way around and end with Ignacio? No. No? Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of like rapid fire questions. Um, I'll try to uh, address one small. Yeah. 
Yeah, so basically uh, by trying, like let's say with the organizational form that we came up with, which is a mix of an alliance of uh, organizations like from the grassroots and uh, the kind of cellular structure that we're developing, that's basically one way that we're trying to talk with each other rather than um, talk about each other, right? So where we have the monthly general assembly that is composed of delegates from the, the cellular level as well as delegates from the organizational level, or rather like all the different organizations like Mediburo, Interventionistische Linke, uh, Education No Limitation, Respect, all these different groups interface with individuals that are being sent up from the cellular level. And that's one way that we basically try to create uh, a horizontal communication, which led to another problem of like, okay, like the monthly strategic meetings aren't enough to actually develop a feeling of solidarity. So what we have to do is actually create like social events and things like that, uh, that create a kind of shared experience uh, beyond the actual concrete political work, but actual de actually developing human relationships with one another. And so, in three minutes, that's the best I could do. Yeah. Oops. I'll be very brief, too. Um, on, the, on your first set of questions, I had already mentioned the ways that we work with our coalition of cities, but on certain issues, it's much more effective to work with uh, social movements or um, other types of partners. So one recent example was on temporary protected status for Haitians, which was uh, under threat of, of termination by the federal government. And in New York, we worked with community leaders uh, from the Haitian diaspora, with council members, with labor leaders, and uh, did press conference day of action, social media action, uh, letters, and um, it was a, it's been a partial success. So it wasn't terminated, it was extended for another six months. We were hoping for 18 months and the advocacy efforts will continue. Um, the narrative piece, I would uh, admit, is still, I think, one of our biggest struggles and something that we're actively thinking about all the time. Um, you know, anti-immigrant forces are portraying immigrants as criminals and as a drains on public welfare and the cities that, uh, that um, are supporting immigrants as harboring criminals and terrorists. And um, unfortunately, I think we end up seeding the national stage on these issues uh, to some of these anti-immigrant narratives because at the local level, often the stories are about the skirmishes and interactions around sanctuary cities issues and becomes very local instead of us having a unified voice that is um, pushing against some of what's happening uh, from the top down. I would say the most successful thing that we've seen in New York City in terms of messaging was around the IDNYC, the municipal ID card, was uh, around, around all New Yorkers, one New York, um, and that kind of unified message. So that's that certainly the type of uh, frame and ideal we want to move toward. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. Going this way. So just, just one, one uh, something very, uh, really brief, uh, listening to you. Um, it's very, very important as a, as a public policy is not to create parallel systems and try to integrate everyone, everyone on the same system and try that this, uh, this uh, system is good for all. So this is just, if you, w if you want to avoid uh, extremism, if you, if you want to avoid exclusion, this is the, the thing that you need to do. And then and you need to reinforce your social, your social uh, uh, services in order that they can fit everybody. But you can have specific programs for specific problems. This is what we have in Barcelona. So we have specific problems for refugees with uh, uh, specific services because they are a population that they have a specific problem, like many other, so homeless, uh, um, uh, uh, with mental issues, um, there are many other uh, uh, pr uh, problems like this. And you need to, to you, what you need to attend is, this, is to have the same rights for, everybody, for, for everyone. So this is the best tool to avoid exclusion. Then uh, relationships with, uh, with uh, groups, uh, civil society, and so on. It's a question also of speed. So uh, being in, a, being in a, passing from the, from the social movement to, a, to a, the municipality, it's something that uh, obliges you to have uh, another, another view, another broad, uh, broader view, and to be, uh, and trying to adapt or trying the, the, the speeds of the municipalities and the, of bureaucracy uh, to, uh, to, your, to your aim, to your political aim. Otherwise, you're, you're, you get lost, and you need to know and you need to be really aware of that, because it, it, otherwise it creates a lot of, a lot of uh, frustration. 
And uh, well, there are many other things, but yeah, I think we, we I think that we are wanted also to listen to the people and the questions, specific questions, and then let's move around. I will try super fast. Um, and I'm very happy that we agree that it has to be for, for all, mm -hmm. uh, because I think that that is the key to everything that is not labeled. Uh, and like you said in the question, the deserving refugees and, and the mig uh, under deserving migrants, we shouldn't, it's very easy. You just don't use that language. You, you don't speak it, words have meanings, and, <coughs> and if it is for everyone. But I see my name here on one question, so I will address that one. Is um, how you, you take a charity relationship and you, you do it mutual. And that is kind of our third step, the livelihood step that I was speaking about. Uh, because we would like to, to say that we don't want donations in the form of money. We want to create job opportunities and the products that we create by that. Support someone in having a job to make them feel like humans again, like they have a purpose. Because it shouldn't be handouts and it's not a good circle to, to, to be in. Um, and I think uh, that is what we try to do in Greece at least. Like in our city, we're not trying to, uh, we're trying to build a community for all of us for us, for them, uh, and not to be polarized. Like it's us in a whole. And if we do that, I think we will be okay. I will not say anything more. Thank you. Um, so now we open it uh, to the room and we're interested in, uh, in two things. One is if you have all these questions in, in, in their way were also for you because a lot of you are very active and working on these questions. So we're interested in what your answers and experiences are. Uh, and of course, your questions for the, for the people on the podium. Uh, and Anna, you? Yeah. We would will, we will like to start with uh, M Emily Canoe. <laughs> um, because we are gonna start the second part of the meeting today. So he, we invited her because we, ha we think he has a very interesting experience to share because uh, he's part of the Emmaus International, which is an international network about 340 grassroots communities in gro and groups in, la in Latin America, Europe, Africa, and Asia. But we are interested specifically in the web network called uh, Organization for University Citizenship that he's gonna share with us. So if you can start, with, and, and then I will pick your questions. Should I speak in this? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks. Thank you, Anna, and good morning. Um, before getting into this experience more specifically, uh, I, I need to tell you just a little bit about what we've been doing since the 50s when this movement has been, uh, was created. We are not an organization focused on migration. Uh, we are not a, a humanitarian organization, and actually we've been doing on uh, to, to fight, I mean, we've been working uh, to fight against exclusion since I think the movement was created immediately after the Second World War, and we were basically trying to create communities and support the creation of communities of excluded people, uh, uh, homeless, jobless, people totally marginalized in the society, and we came to migration based on this experience, because we rapidly understood that uh, it was this uh, uh, um, emergency humanitarian um, approach and the, the, uh, the increasing militarization of migration policies that was creating exclusion, actually. Whereas in our communities, these communities are basically self-organized. We uh, provide community organizer and social workers, but the idea is to bring together people. We have in France around 70 groups, uh, and in Europe around 200. 
between two, 10, 15 people till, till 70, 80 people. And these people come together to live together and they develop economic activities in the community and in relation uh, with the, the, the neighborhood, villages, small cities they live close to, uh, in order to cover their own uh, needs. We support access to rights, basically. So when someone comes, we, tr we help this person to make sure that she access or he accesses health, uh, social benefits, if one's entitled to, and provide work within the community because we, we think that everybody has skills, capacities, whatever it is, and as you say, uh, working brings back people to, to social uh, uh, existence, interaction, and sense of citizenship somehow. And uh, since the end of the 90s, we've seen uh, uh, migrants coming more and more uh, numerous, and, and of course, profil profiles of migrants changing too, because from uh, a situation where migrants were rather economic migrants, let's say, and with the possibility to, at some point, get uh, legal allowance to stay, of course, this is not the same public any longer, and now in our communities, half of the people are undocumented migrants and, and uh, asylum seekers who were denied uh, the right to stay. So uh, based on this uh, um, assessment that the migration policies actually were the, 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 uh, the origin of the problem, uh, we built this network of organizations in France in the big, at, at the beginning. We try to connect with other organizations working on the same issue and uh, on the same uh, perspective too, which is access to rights and, and same rights for all is key. That's the first uh, uh, need. Second, uh, we need to share experiences. We need, we need to strengthen ourselves and we need also to uh, address the, the political, I mean, the migration policies as such, as part of the issue. We cannot stay at the emergency level because this is one of the, the roots of the, sea, uh, of the, the problem. Yes. Uh, initially, we created this organi 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 organization of, pour la citoyenneté universelle, so organization for universal citizenship, uh, based on the proposal that uh, we are all citizens, everybody, I mean, uh, um, migration is a fundamental freedom that should be defended and that everybody can, uh, can reclaim. We created a campaign with a passport for universal citizenship. And last year, uh, during the World Social Forum on Migration in Sao Paulo, in Brazil, we met the, the mayor of Sao Paulo, and this guy elected since 2012, member of the uh, PT, Parti des Travailleurs, has been had been developing a very interesting policies regarding, policy regarding migrants uh, and migration in his city. And in the discussion with him and the city, we proposed in Sao Paulo in December 2016 to launch a call, a global call, for the creation of a civil society organization and local authorities alliance on migration for uh, the, the universal uh, freedom of, of movement and migration with four key uh, objectives. No, I need to finish, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, welcoming migrants must be based on access to right and not on uh, uh, emergency approach. Second, migrants must be included in the collective choices and in the municipal processes. There are many ways to do that, but it's, it's necessary. Third, migration must be also included in the uh, municipal program, municipal services around school programs, cultural programs, 
because this is also what helps to decrease radicalism and extreme right radicalism, and we made this experience in different uh, places in, in France. And la the last thing I, I would like to say uh, is that these last months we really experienced a radicalization of uh, repression towards migrants, of course, but also towards uh, activists trying to work in solidarity with them locally. And this is really something we would like also to work with local authorities, how to uh, be a, politi a political force together to challenge this real thing, because it's not possible that in Europe, nowadays, food distributions are banned and, and uh, banned by the police. Activists are assaulted, arrested, uh, trialed, and we see the possibility of acting in solidarity and developing this long-term perspective of uh, uh, building new uh, migration policies basically killed by the, the, uh, the state policies. So this is really something, I think, key. And I really hope that this is uh, the first step of a longer-term discussion and, and in, in order to build this real political partnership. Thanks. Thank you, Amelie. <laughs> so, uh, another example of how citizens' engagement uh, and social movement organizing is, is innovative in a way that often institutions have a difficulty with because they're, they're bound in, in all sorts of ways. Uh, and the importance of mutual learning and especially like uh, muni municipalities listening to what's going on uh, in the neighborhoods and so on. So let's open it to the audience, uh, to all of you. Uh, in so questions and inspiring examples, experiences, etc. cetera. Uh, and you have a, al already a yeah, list? Yeah, I have already a list and I will suggest two minutes each intervention. So. Um, Well, yeah. Well, well, yeah, both. <laughs> uh, hi, good morning. My name is Esther. Um, I am a refugee and a migration lawyer, and uh, I work for the Polar Park in Spain. So we, we receive a lot of migrants and refugees uh, for moving to Polar Park. We are based in Valencia, and I work with uh, people in, in, in detention. Um, so, as a refugee and migration lawyer, I would like to, um, to point out a concern that I have and that I think that we should put on the, on the public agenda. Is this from civil society? We're still talking about this difference between refugees and migrants. And, um, and the Geneva Convention was signed in 1951 and then in 1957, so it's been a long time. And uh, some forms of, of persecution were not that as are happening now, they were not in the conventional at that time. So I think that from the civil society, we have to look forward to, to change all this course and to put this discourse of no difference between migrants and refugees, since, for example, a person who migrated from Senegal could, uh, during those three years of migration process, be victim of human trafficking which, or any human rights violation which is recovered. So I think this is dangerous to, to make this difference because it opens the room to um, uh, not having a clear assessment of a human rights violation or an asylum claim or, or any other form of, of persecution. And I think that you pointed out that we should have this, uh, those kind of, um, of uh, discourse um, towards the political agenda, right? Um, also, um, I was also thinking about uh, this Ley La Ley de Empadronamiento, which uh, restricts access to basic human rights, which is um, housing, health education, uh, the freedom of enjoying the public spaces. And I mean, I think we have to remind also the, the obligation and uh, to protect those human rights is from the state and the municipality and the government. So, I mean, to put that on the political agenda that. The, the system of the development of the restriction to this inscription is provoking a recurrent human rights violation of part of the population. So this is also something that I would like to um, diagnose with you on putting that on the, on the agenda. Thank you. 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 Thank you
At the same time, and that's the great paradox, I think there are like thousands, like, yeah, of course, thousands and maybe dozens of thousands of initiatives across Europe, very local and tiny stuff done by citizens because they they just can't stand it and they don't want to live in that world and they don't want to just be inactive and passive and, and get used to, you know, the normalization of, of like cruelty, violence, uh, like so many horrible things. So we see those both things happening and being here, you know, in this meeting, I wanted to ask, is there, what is existing or can we create some kind of strong network in Europe based on what is already existing at, you know, in different cities, but for all those citizens uh, in Europe who, I mean, the situation we are in, 
people are crushed by the policies and by the repression, they are forced back to inaction, depression, craziness, whatever you name it, I mean, very negative things. So I was coming here uh, to talk about many things, but really I was hoping for this meeting this morning because we need some kind of, you know, horizon. I mean, it's really interesting. I work with the NGO, we're developing some action, we're trying to have some interaction with the municipality, we're doing our best, but clearly we get the sense that it's a bit of a dead hand. We will continue, but we need some, <laughs> some hope and we need like strength from other people, I believe. So, yeah, that's my call for this morning.
progressive approach towards teaching school districts and teachers how to handle anti-racist practices, how to talk about language, why immigrants who can say hello to you, um, you know, in the hallway feel uncomfortable in the cafeterias and how we build like collaborative spaces. But those racist and abusive tendencies that happen to children and high schoolers when they are young and do not get addressed become explicitly abusive and prejudice practices when they become adults later. And so it is really important for us to focus in on supporting immigrants, and, and that means supporting low-income people and people of color um, in all those spaces. So I just wanted to if you have any Yeah. 
justice actors on how to handle uh, the double issue of environmental crisis and, and migration influx at the time of global turbulence. And uh, one thing that's kind of interesting is came out uh, in the interventions of our colleagues here is about how do we fight back the outsourcing of policies in this neoliberal age where uh, with the Trumps, with Global from Paris Agreement and everything, now there's a heavy emphasis on cities. So cities are kind of they get put up uh, front line, but at the same time, they are being disenfranchised and kind of, you say, we dump the refugees in the cities, we dump the climate policy in the cities, you handle this. How do we fight this back from bottom up with a radical grassroots municipalist agenda? One thing that comes up to my mind is about the free municipalization services, like in Berlin about the energy here in Barcelona as well. So how do we make these in line with the migration agenda? How do we incorporate this? Thank you. So, Gordon I work um, as a community organizer in the United States with faith institutions, and we're pressing every religious institution in our cities and states to declare itself a sanctuary and stand with um, immigrants facing deportation. We're losing families in the United States every day. People who are being deported, um, detained and deported, um, including people who live in the country for many years. And that's leading to the question of what is our leverage? How can we stop this as cities and as social movements? And I think one of the questions I have listening to this in the context of various cities is whether the frame of welcoming and integrating is the right frame versus the race frame and understanding why this is happening and the question of how, how can we use all of the power that our cities have as homes to big corporations and capital and as, as cities that have a lot of leverage to influence state and federal policy and, and maybe international policy. But are we, are we really pushing the envelope of what a city could do if it was truly Paris. My name is Jamie. I'm the director of the Policy and Profession Daily in Portland, Oregon. And we recently declared ourselves a sanctuary city, but we're still really struggling with what that means on a day-to-day basis, other than just words. Uh, we're in a very significant housing crisis, so our office is heavily focused on that. So I have two very specific questions for New York. Um, I'd like to know if you, the city has added immigration status to its protected classes, and if that's had a positive impact on fair housing law. And also whether your municipal ID system is available to the houseless population, because we're really interested in that kind of struggle. Thank you.
potential to be able to cure the entity. So there is these kind of uh, initiatives. here if you didn't uh, if you can fill your name and, and your email email address and if you want to share some information with all of the group just send it to me and and we can share with uh, the rest of the group as, as uh, the bit the videos that we want to share or some specific or some invitations that I heard here if you want to make it formal you can write it and we share all, with all together so Excuse me? Um, I think it's for streaming, but um, I don't know. We are, we are going to know in the next weeks if we are able to put it in, in a, on a link access. We will let you know. Yeah. So. All right. So um, we're uh, at the very end. Uh, I would like you to address very quickly because there's been some direct questions. Uh, very final points, be very brief so people have time for a coffee before the next session. Okay. 
All right, extremely brief. First, just want to thank Sarah for mentioning uh, states, which I should have, but just constraints of uh, time, but certainly a major focus for us in Texas, a major focus for us right now. Um, I appreciated the comment about the environmental movements because I think there's a lot that we can learn there uh, in terms of building um, coalitions across cities to do work in the migration space, and that's an area that we're trying to model around. Um, I do think that the welcoming and sanctuary framing uh, can sometimes be inadvertently othering and that there may be um, ways that we can have terminology that's uh, more inclusive and empowering, so that is something that we think about. Um, on the issue of uh, legal services and who it covers, the administration is, is still working on the program model, but uh, it is the case that in the, a small subset of cases where a, an immigrant has been charged and convicted of a very serious crime like murder, rape, uh, kidnapping, that they would be excluded from taxpayer funding um, for, for that legal representation, but it's a very small number. Um, and I'll maybe connect with Portland after to connect, make sure we connect you to the right resources on those questions. Well, <clears throat> sorry. So there are so many issues that uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going for, to forget someone. I'm, I'm available later if you want to have a one-on-one -on -one issue. So uh, about uh, the first question there from Valencia, yeah, you're right. So uh, uh, it's empadronamiento and, and, and uh, uh, city cards and all these kind of issues are one of the things that cities can do without mainly any cost and if it's only political uh, will. So yeah, it's one of the things that we can all do without being uh, uh, accused of anything. So it's something that your, your municipal uh, autonomy is, is, uh, is okay, is all right. So uh, on that, so I want to, I want to, 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 uh, to say something which is cities, we are uh, uh, fighting on, on all these issues. So without having extra funds, so Barcelona has not received an extra fund since uh, 2011. So this all comes from municipal taxes which is something that it has to be shown because uh, uh, it should be uh, subsidized by state or by the European Union. So we are banned from receiving direct funds from the uh, from, uh, European Union. We have no information about fluxes, about who is going to come, when they are going to come. So if you know a bit uh, how the municipalities work, we work on a, on a yearly basis for planning and anything. So we don't know what to do. So we are now doing these policies a bit without knowing uh, what is going, going on. And, uh, and third, we have a, a really limited political autonomy that we are taking and that might be one day they are going to, give, to, to take it back. So we are be aware that uh, uh, we might be charged for that. So it's just something that I said before. So constitutional tribunal is going to, just, to say, no, guys, you cannot do this. This is, this is uh, 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 something that is only competence of the region, of the, of the state. So we are always uh, on, this, uh, on these boundaries of doing legal, legal things. So, we have, in Barcelona, we have the municipal chart, which gives us quite a, uh, uh, of an autonomy, but it's kind of a, we are just squeezing like a chewing gum, kind of trying to adapt it to everything, so we might not succeed for, uh, on that. So we might also uh, go to, to courts to, to, uh, to, to defend this right. About Beirut, uh, the, we are doing things with Beirut. We have cooperation issues, we are uh, f uh, a municipal, uh, uh, with uh, Lebanon, sorry, not Beirut, but we're in Saida, we are in Sur, Cooperating and doing a city-to-city -city cooperation between technicians in uh, in Barcelona and technicians on on, on these uh, on these two cities. About racisms, yes, it's something that you need to tackle. So uh, uh, we are trying. We have different policies that I cannot. I don't have time to to uh, to say now. But yeah, we have different policies tackling racism and doing uh, anti uh, uh, anti. Um, how do you say this? Uh, sorry anti-Islamophobia, anti-racism, so we have uh, raising awareness policies, we have a municipal board that uh, is also a, a great political actor in, 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 the, in the policies of, uh, of Barcelona City uh, uh, Hall. I don't know, so uh, I'm, I'm forgetting a lot, sorry for that, but I, I'm available in the next half an hour to, to answer anything you might need. Yeah, um, obviously this has a lot to do about race. I mean, we're talking about nation states and the EU, and those are premised on racial constructs, and the power relationships like revolve around that. Um, 
But I mean, this is exactly what we're trying to address through, I mean, this is exactly what we're trying to address through a different lens uh, as to how to disarticulate these kind of mechanisms through a means of analyzing the city. Um, I hope I didn't make myself uh, unclear in saying that uh, uh, with, the, with the health policy that we're working for right now, it is not specifically framed towards refugees or undocumented folk, but there are, uh, like it's, uh, it's geared at anyone who hasn't been able to get the standard German healthcare that's privatized. And um, so we're trying to deal with that, but it's also the problems of very complex like legal coding that is like, I mean, Germany invented like Franz Kafka, right? Like it's really terrible bureaucratic subcodes for different groups. And so we're trying to, to work around specifically that. And um, like in terms of like, uh, like the US case, like this is one of the things I thought would be easy like in Germany is like, okay, like, well, we could just tell the police like not to cooperate with ICE or something like that. But the German local police is actually an attachment to the federal police. And so there's like no way to like, so we have to think about the ways that we could develop like different levels of strength. And so right now we're small and micro and we don't have the capacity or the kind of leverages to pull off like national transformation or EU wide transformation. And so like what we can do right now is try to build up little by little municipal transformations and in the hope that through uh, networking like this, we could actually develop the kind of organizational forms that can build up to contest the actual foundations of the, the EU and actually make it something that's democratic. And this is why things like this are really important for us. In Greece and in the municipalities in Greece, there should be a, a committee for the minorities. Uh, in Kilkis at the moment, it's not really active, so we're working with the municipality, uh, so they can have the wo uh, their voice uh, heard uh, in, yeah, in the municipality. Uh, but what I would like to say is because we have our population at the moment, it's a population that is on the move, and they're going to move to other European countries, either through the real relocation or the family reunification program. So for us, uh, it would be very interesting for the people that is uh, within the European Union to make connections so we could have kind of a platform, like a landing platform, so the people that leave our program, when they come, for example, to Spain, that we know that there are people to pick them up. Uh, and also to answer the question that, that you had, uh, the support that they need, bef even if they're in transit, uh, like in our program, they have, uh, we have social scientists, we have anthropologists, uh, psychosocial support, uh, a medical um, support team. Uh, so it has to start because we have people in Greece that have been waiting for one year, one and a half maybe, before they land to Spain. So if we have this platform, maybe when they come, then they don't have to start from zero again. Uh, and that is very important. And also, Lebanon, I think we could speak later on. It would be very interesting. And if anybody wants to ask something, uh, we will be here. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, we've had two amazing note takers over here. Um, and their notes will be compiled, uh, sent to you guys. If you have anything to add, please do. Amelie would like to...